Good morning and welcome to Tarso Ministry Worship Services. We're glad you're able to join us this morning. We have changed the time to our service. It is 1130 and it will be 1130 moving forward. So we do ask that you will get the word around to let people know and also to remember it that we are starting the services at 1130. At this time, we're going to start with our opening prayer and let's pray. Eternal Father in heaven, loving Lord, we thank you for the Sabbath day. We thank you for this time to be able to come and as your sons and daughters be able to worship you, honoring our creator. We thank you, Lord, for the many trials and tribulations that you have gotten us through. And we know that we have fiery ones yet to come our way. But we know that by your strength, might, and power, we're able to be victorious if we keep our eyes upon Jesus and trust you in all things. Let us become deep, totally dependent upon you as we allow your spirit to lead, guide, direct, and instruct us. We pray for every soul in this line, for those who have yet to join, that you will bless the services today and let your spirit abide in our hearts and help us to be able to understand the message today. So we ask that you will give the unction of the Holy Spirit to our pastor and for you to fill him with your words and with your spirit. And may we all be able to gain knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. Thank you for being with us. And thank you once again, Lord, for loving us as your sons and daughters and giving us Jesus Christ, our soon to come King, for it is in his name that we pray, amen. Now at this time, we'll have our opening song title, Make Me Like You.
What a beautiful song that was. We all want to be like Jesus. And if we keep ourselves close to him, we'll be able to wear his image in his totality. At this time, we're going to have our scripture reading, and it comes from the book of Daniel, chapter 12. And we'll be reading with verse 1. Daniel 12, verse 1. And before we read, we're going to ask for the Holy Spirit to be with us as we open up the Word of God. So let's pray. Father in heaven, loving Lord, we ask for your Spirit to now come and give us the interpretation of your Word today. And as we open up your Word and begin to read it, we pray just for that. We need light, interpretation, wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. And we ask that you would bless everyone to be able to receive this, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, and it says, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was, since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. At this time, we'll have our song of meditation titled, Use Me, Lord.
thy will Use me, Lord, to do thy will As your instrument I pray Use me each and every So shining light in this world of darkness, spread your love and truth through me. Spread your love. time we'll hear the message today titled the final israeli islamic war in bible prophecy by pastor shalom Clemens. pastor thank you let us pray father in heaven as we come before your throne today we ask for your holy spirit to speak to us as we talk about prophecy and aspects of prophecy that are often forgotten Bless us now in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. As my wife mentioned, our topic is the final Israeli-Islamic War. Although it may not be called that, my brothers and sisters, that is actually prophesied in the Bible, and I will show it to you by the grace of God today. You know, the Bible tells us that there are going to be wars and rumors of wars. So just wars in general are prophesied in the Bible, Matthew 24, verse 6. And it says, And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. And before I go any further, I just want to let you all know, that we're blessed to have Brother Baji with us out of New York, and we're just grateful, happy to have all of you all, but it's very good to have him with us, and uh, hopefully we'll be hearing from Sister Daphne as well, um, calling in, and uh, pray for me. I am uh, not the best at multitasking, but we're going to do all we can to have everyone who wants to hear the truth to be able to hear the truth, so we have some technology that we have to patch them in and we just need to make sure that uh, we're doing it right. Okay. So that being said, um, if you uh, see that I have to be a little distracted, um, that's just because um, I just need to make sure everything is working quite right. So what do we have here, brothers and sisters? Wars and rumors of wars. But what a lot of people don't know is that the role of Islam was actually uh, predicted by the Bible. Their role was actually predicted. Um, the, the fact that they would be a enemy, so to speak, of Islam, I'm sorry, of Israel. And actually, I apologize. The slide should say the world is against, no, that's right. The world is against Islam and Islam against the world. That's what the Bible actually uh, teaches. OK, and um, we need to recognize that it's right there in Genesis 16, 11 and 12. Let's read it together. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, behold, thou art with child. Now, this is God talking to Hagar. Behold, thou art with child and shall bear a son and shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. 
and he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Now, brothers and sisters, there is a lot of corruption in the world. And as we'll get into this message a little later, some people think that everything Islamic is bad. And they think if there's a conflict between Islam and Israel, Israel is always right. And Islam is always wrong. And I'm going to tell you, hopefully I'll get to it in the sermon. A lot of that came from Jesuit influence. It was the Jesuit that actually put forth a uh, teaching that some things would take place with Israel being exalted in the last days and a antichrist coming. So anything that would go against Israel is just looked upon as bad. And most Christians accept that and don't realize where that thinking came from. The Bible does teach us, however, that as we get into looking at history and the present and the future, the Bible says that as it relates to the descendants of Hagar and Ishmael, that the world would be against them and they would be against the world. Didn't say that they were always the main ones at fault. Uh, Bit, but it because a lot of Christians would like to think that, but that's not the case. But it does say that the world would ally itself with Israel and they would all be against the Islamic movement, uh, the Islamic movement against every other movement. Just keep that in mind. That's Genesis chapter 16, verses 11 and 12. Okay, let's go to our next slide. Now, we're watching on television these pro Palestinian. Uh, uh, protest on various college and university campuses. And a lot of people um, are even the faculty and staff of some of these places believe that their Palestinian uh, Islamic students are their free speech is being violated. Um, you know, the news is biased. And so you kind of pick up a bias. They're not really showing a whole lot of violence or anything like that. But, you know, they're being stopped, they're being arrested, so on and so forth. OK, so I just wanted to show you that there is this leaning toward an anti-Islamic thinking, um, even though the Jews killed Christ. OK, it wasn't the Islamic Islamics that killed Christ. It was the Jews that killed Christ. I'm just showing you how the Bible, I'm not beating up on the Jews. I'm simply showing you how the Bible is true. That even though that history against Christ himself is present there, still the Bible says all the world would be against the descendants of Ishmael, which would be the Islamic nations, and all of and that entity would be against the world. So I just wanted to show you. Uh and 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 the Bible is is making it very clear, and it's really um good to see that. Uh, God authenticates himself with prophecy. You see, if you read Isaiah 46, 9 and 10, the Bible says, remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God, there is none like me. So how does he prove that there's none like him? The rest of the verse says, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done. You see, so God tells us, and it's more to the verse, but the Bible tells us that God authenticates himself because at the very beginning, he can tell you what's going to happen all the way at the end, okay? And that is powerful, brothers and sisters, and that's why we know, and therefore people who claim it's a serious thing to claim to be a prophet, brothers and sisters, because if you say anything prophetically, as the, if you say God spoke to me, if you say something and it is, does not come true, you are a false prophet, according to the book of Deuteronomy. It says, do not be afraid of him. He hath, the Lord hath not spoken through him. And so I can tell you right now, I love prophecy. I love to teach and, and I don't understand. I'm not saying I got, have every understanding of every single item, but I will tell you, brothers and sisters, I'm not a prophet. Uh, so uh, you, you can't claim that I claim to be a prophet. I'm boldly telling you, unless God reveals to me that he's given me that gift, if he does, I will surely let you know I am not a prophet. Um, but we have been given prophets who wrote the Bible. Uh, we've been given a gift of prophecy beyond the Bible that's mentioned in the book of Revelation. It says that 
uh, that the devil would in Revelation 12, 17, would make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Revelation 19, 10 says the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And 1 Corinthians 1, verses 6 and 7 says this gift uh, is a gift given to the people. The testimony of Christ is a gift given to the people waiting for the coming of the Lord. So God tells us, brothers and sisters, that the people of God who have God, the Bi who follow the Bible in the last days, would have some gift, post-biblical gift, that means it's after the Bible was written, that would help guide them as we get closer to the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, the spirit of prophecy can be also manifested in occasional dreams and visions given to people. But to claim to be a prophet, that is, uh, you're false if you predict something that doesn't happen. The Bible predicts that Islam through Turkey would conquer Israel and then be destroyed. Very few people know this, brothers and sisters. I'm here to tell you that among some who claim to be Seventh-day Adventists, okay, there is a historic view that aligns with what I just said, okay? But there is a relatively newer view. Now, it's been around for a long time based on my 56 years of life, but the point being made is the historic view was that the king of the north was Turkey. But notice what the Bible says. We're going to get into this because it's very, very going to be very important as we look and, and when we are in a very, very serious crisis to be able to give us courage and hope to know that it's almost over. OK, Daniel 11, verse 45, and he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. Now, remember, the Bible told us that they would come up that that as it relates to the descendants of Ishmael, they would be against everybody else and everybody else will be against them. Just keep that in mind when you read this. He shall come to his end and none shall help him. Now, there are teachings more modern that this represents the papacy. And I'm going to show you that cannot be, brothers and sisters. You know, when Jesus came on this earth the first time, think about the first coming of Jesus. The people of God, which was the Jewish nation, had a preoccupation with Rome. They wanted to be delivered from Rome. They thought everything was Rome, Rome, Rome. And we who are waiting for the second coming of Jesus, although the Roman Catholic Church will play a role in end time events, we're clearly told she has had her day. She's not going to be the main player that does the main dirty, dastardly deeds. Unfortunately, it's going to be the United States of America that will lead out in that, brothers and sisters. But we will be able, when we are in a crisis time, to look at the news and be able to see by this event that's taking place, the Bible predicts that the Islamic rule through Turkey is going to take over Israel, but then they will come to their end. And the, you'll see why that's significant as you contemplate the scripture that my wife read. We'll talk about that in a moment. So I want to share this with you. We have, I mean, it would take sermons to go through Daniel 11. Okay, so we're not going to go through Daniel 11, but let me just say this. You're looking on the screen and everybody can't see the screen, but it's a screen of Russia, Europe, you know, and some of the areas surrounding that. So it actually shows you Turkey. If you can watch my, I'm kind of highlighting the word Turkey right here. Now, this is particularly a map. The maps change from time to time as it depends on who's ruling. But basically, during the time of the end, around 1798, this would have been a proper map for that because the rule of Turkey extended all the way down. And But now you'll notice that at the present time, you'll see that I have Palestine and Israel, which is below Turkey. What I will tell you is that if you study Daniel 11, without exception, 100% consistently, whoever ruled above this area of Palestine and Israel, Israel was where God's people were, was the king of the north. And they did change hands. Sometimes a pagan Roman official uh, was ruling in Syria and, and that type of thing, which is, you know, right below where you're seeing, if you can see where my... Uh, uh, cursor is circling. That's around Syria. Okay. There would be Romans. There would be, uh, it started off with Medo-Persia. Okay. 
And then the south of this, which would be Egypt, whoever was ruling Egypt was the king of the south. And that is how Daniel 11 goes from the beginning to the end. And what has happened, brothers and sisters, over years of time, brethren disconnect things and come up with different ideas, okay? I'm not, I'm not basting them as bad people, okay? Uh, uh, but I am saying that it is not much different than how the 70-week prophecy, which had a clear delineation of events, taking that last week of that prophecy and kind of dissecting it and putting it in a different context. Um, it's not much different to take an entire chapter, 45 verses, and all through the chapter, whoever was north of Palestine was king of the north, and all throughout that chapter, whoever was south of Palestine was king of the south. There is nothing in that chapter that rightfully would cause you to uh, uh, a reasonable interpretation, uh, if we follow rules of a reasonable interpretation, that should have us deviate from that pattern. Okay, and I'm going to show you in the Bible how it fits perfectly and leads us to where we're going today. Okay, so I just wanted you all to see the map. Everybody can't see it, but here's a little um, summary. It says, the king of the north was always whoever was ruling north of Palestine. Currently, it is Turkey. Turkey, an Islamic country, is the only fulfillment of this prophecy if we follow sound rules of prophetic interpretation. The next point, just as with the Jews at the first coming of Christ, most Sabbath keepers have an obsession with Rome. Everything's the papacy, the papacy, the papacy. Now, the papacy is bad, brothers and sisters. I didn't say every Roman Catholic person was bad. I'm talking about the system, the leadership. The Bible calls the Pope the man of sin. The Bible calls that entity the abomination of desolation. Although the papacy plays a role in end-time events, he is not the king of the north. So what we're going to do is I'm going to take you through several verses of Daniel 11, but by no means is this an exhaustive view, but it's going to take you through certain parts of Daniel 11, and it's going to show you, you can't really disconnect this from its context, okay, and cause it to be some kind of spiritual king of the north now making it the papacy. So Daniel 11, verse 35 through 38 says, and some of them understand sorry, and some of them of understanding shall fall, to try them and purge them and make them white, even to the time of the end. Now, every, particularly Adventist person and those who've studied prophecy understand the time of the end denotes 1798. Uh, we don't have time to go into it, but the time of the end would begin after uh, 1,203 score days, 42 months, time, time, dividing of time, 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 half a time, all of those represented the period of Roman Catholic supremacy from 538 AD to 1798 AD, okay? They, the, they, they overcame the Vandals, uh, which were opposing them, and af after uh, uh, Emperor Justinian gave the Pope the scepter, making him Pontifus Mag... What is that? Pontifus Magamus? I forget the term, but anyway, that means he's basically uh, head of church and state. OK, and uh, it went into effect when they delivered, when they overcame the Vandals, which is one of those Germanic ger tribes. And that took effect in 538 A.D. And if you count 1260 years, just like the Bible says you should, you come down to 1798 when Napoleon's general Berthier took the pope captive. So watch this. I'll read it again. And some of them of understanding shall fall. This is talking about the Protestants who were martyred to try them and to purge and to make them white, even to the time of the end. Papal supremacy ended when the Pope was taken captive in 1798, because it is yet for a time appointed. God appointed that time. He allowed them to reign for that a period of time and influence the nations, bringing church and state together to punish what they called heresy, which were those who followed the Bible. And the king shall do according to his will, and she shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods. Some people might say this is the papacy. It is not. It is France. And if you read it carefully, it is France who took 
the Pope captive at the time of the end. And so, and the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every God. That's not the papacy. How do we know? And shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods and shall prosper till the indignation be passed. You see, the Roman Catholic Church just claims to be the head of Christianity. They're not so much speaking against Christianity, but the but the but France did. And they and they and they came on the scene at the time of the end. And they and they took and they brought in atheism and the destruction of the family unit was all the work of France. Okay? Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers nor the desire of women. That's talking about France and their annihilation of Christianity and the exaltation of atheism. And it went along with, they basically depreciated the institution of marriage. It just became this little contract. If you want to sleep with somebody else, it's fine. You, you know, it was just this communal, it was just very uh, satanic and immoral, brothers and sisters. And that what is, was during the time of the exaltation of the goddess of reason nor regard any God. See, that's not the papacy. The papacy says, oh, God is God. We're just the vicegerent. We're just the personal deputy. But, but it was France that wouldn't regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all, but in his estate he shall honor the God of forces. So what actually happened was they began to realize that people wanted to see something. They didn't want to exalt the God of the Jews or the God of the Christians, uh, but they realized they, they've got to make people think that there's something that they can look up to. And this is all history. So they manufactured this goddess of reason and they made a statue out of her. So, it, so it's a goddess of reason, okay? So in his estate shall he honor the God of forces, okay? And a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. So their God was the God of reason, their own mind, but they had a female statue to uh, exemplify it. And so it was the forces of error and uh, de deception and, 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 and their own human thinking, okay? Not a, a deity per se. That's what God is saying, and that's not a representation of the Roman Catholic Church. They believe in God. They believe he has a heaven that's, that's in place. We do too. They believe he has a hell that's burning now. We do not. The Bible does not teach that. They even added purgatory to the, to the, to the uh, program, okay? And so the bottom line, brothers and sisters, is there is a mistake that even most Adventists make when they say the king of the north is the papacy. It does not fit. This God or this entity didn't 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 claim any real deity was the god but then eventually if the people said we want something they came up with this goddess of reason let's read on thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange god whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory and shall cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land for gain and what you'll find if you study the history uh, uh, as France took over various regions in order to gain money, uh, they would actually uh, sell off land that they had conquered. Uh, that land in various countries was not to be sold, but when they took over, they sold it uh, to rich people to gain money. And at that time, and at the time of the end, see, this is still in context, shall the king of the south push at him. Now, the time of the end, 1798, what happened? Egypt made war with France but they didn't do much. So have you ever seen two people fighting and they just kind of starts with a push? It didn't start with a punch. It just starts with a push. A push is not a very strong act and will generally, if that's all you do is push, you're not going to win the fight, okay? When people are slinging left hooks and right jabs and all you can do is push, you know, so the Bible is describing the weak effort of Egypt to come against France and they lost. And the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind. Now, a whirlwind has lots of destruction. Ask people that are storm chasers about what, what hurricanes and tornadoes look like, okay? The whirlwind, you've seen it on TV. So at the time of the end, 1798, when France was moving forward, they conquered Egypt, although Egypt gave a little pushback, but they did not conquer Turkey. Turkey whipped them. 
and they came at them like a whirlwind. So remember that map I showed you? You had Egypt down below. You had the area above that, which is Israel and Palestine, and that is where France was, okay? They had conquered Egypt. Now they're headed toward, um, they're fighting against the king of the north, which is Turkey. So Turkey would be, have to come down, okay? And it says, they came with a whirlwind and with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships, and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. So the record of history is that France was defeated by Turkey. That happened. It's not the papacy. The papacy didn't defeat France. France defeated the papacy. And, and, and at the time of the end, the, the Pope was taken captive. Okay, now we're going to show you the significance of all this and how it even helps us in the last days. But I'm just sharing these things with you because, you know, a lot of people have gone a different way with this thinking, but it's super clear and we don't have permission to go outside of the context of these verses. It says he shall enter also into the glorious land and many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape out of his hand, Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon. Brothers and sisters, these all were somewhat related to Israel, but they're smaller Eastern countries. And when Turkey came down and conquered many, they did not bother those that were East. It just wasn't in their pathway of, of, of conquest. And the children of Edom and Moab and the chief children of Ammon. And to my understanding, these uh, small countries uh, are still in you know, Turkey is not enemies and they even Turkey even pays them a yearly uh, you might say due or fee or tax so they can unmolested they can travel through to go to Mecca okay so I just wanted to share that with you he shall stretch forth his hand also up on the countries and the land of Egypt shall not escape so Turkey actually went down and they took over Egypt this is history the papacy didn't take care, take over Egypt, friends, but Turkey did. But he shall have power over the treasuries of gold and silver. It's a lot of money in the Islamic countries, brothers and sisters. And over all the precious things of Egypt and the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his step. For the most part, this is his, this is all history. This this already happened. OK, so that's how we can know that it's truth and that it's Bible because it already happened. But look at Daniel 11, verse 45, the very next verse. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore, he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make away many. And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. This is future brothers and sisters. And so why would this have any significance? We'll show you in a little while as we move forward in our, in our study. Okay, now what would be the tidings out of the East and out of the North? Again, I'm not a prophet. I'm just a student of prophecy. I do know that major players North of Turkey and East of Turkey would be Russia and China. And we do know that they have an alliance. It's a communistic-like alliance. Uh, promoting the concepts of communism or those that kind of thinking. Um, and so I don't know exactly, but I do know that there's been a long-standing conflict between Russia because there's this body of water. I think it's the Black Sea, but there's a body of water that kind of separates Turkey and uh, Russia. And Turkey pretty much has had control of the lands around there for the most part, but Russia's always wanted it because that would be a seaport they could use in the winter. You know, Russia is real cold. And so they didn't have, that was the only place to launch their ships, um, but it's under Turkish control. And so they wanted it. They've always wanted it. That's a, that's a known fact. Okay. So tidings, we don't know exactly all the issues of the tidings, but we do know that there's constant conflict between Israel and the Islamic countries, and Turkey is an Islamic country. I'm going to show you some things that people don't look at. You see a lot of end-time events being posted, mostly about the papacy, and we're ignoring or just neglecting to see some of the things that have been talked about through Turkey. And I want to thank God for brethren that um, 
have held true to this view and they send me things and I'm able to post some of these uh, things that I can share with you today. Now, I believe this next is a little video, okay? And I'm going to play it. This is talking about Turkey and Egypt Alliance. It may be five minutes. We may not play the whole thing, but I want you to see what is happening that you don't hear about in those who pre most of the time when you hear those who promote in time events. Turkey and Egypt Alliance. For those who can't see, it's uh, two presidents coming together. There's going to be sound and, and words. Now let's look at West Asia and North Africa, two regional powerhouses coming together, Egypt and Turkey. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan arrived in Cairo yesterday. It's his first visit to Egypt in more than a decade. He came here last in 2012. And the following year, their relationship went south. Egypt and Turkey have been at odds ever since. Now, that period of hostility seems to be over. Yesterday, there was a grand reconciliation. It began with the Egyptian president, Abdel Fateh al-Sisi, greeting Erdogan as he landed. It was a grand red carpet welcome, signaling an end to years of animosity. Both leaders then went to Egypt's presidential palace. The pomp and pageantry continued. There were guards of honor, cheering crowds, choreographed handshakes, the works. Then came the press conference. Take a look. We have upgraded our high-level strategic cooperation council to the level of presidents. Attempts to exile the people of Gaza from their lands are null and void for us. Efforts to depopulate Gaza are not acceptable. In the medium term, we are ready to work with Egypt for Gaza to recover and be rebuilt. We had the opportunity to evaluate the issues in Libya, Sudan and Somalia. We give full support to the unity, togetherness, territorial integrity and peace of these three brotherly countries. I agreed with President Erdogan during our talks on the need for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza and the need to achieve stability in the West Bank in order to be able to continue the peace process as soon as possible, reaching the declaration of the sovereign Palestinian state with the borders of the 4th of June 1967 with Jerusalem as its capital. The focus is evident. Their talks revolved around the Israel-Hamas war. It seems to have brought these countries together. But that was just the latest push. They've been trying to mend ties for years now. But what led to the breakup in the first place? You see, in 2013, Mohamed Morsi was the president of Egypt. Turkey saw him as a friend. But the Egyptian army ousted him. And who led the army? Abdel Fateh al-Sisi, the current president. He was the coup leader. Turkey denounced him and his new regime. And that's not all. Erdogan even gave refuge to members of the Muslim Brotherhood. That's the group that Mohamed Morsi belonged to, the Muslim Brotherhood. Egypt had banned them and declared them terrorists. But Erdogan gave them a safe haven in Turkey. Obviously, ties snapped. And this bitterness manifested in other arenas as well, most notably in Libya. A civil war has raged through Libya over, for over a decade. Egypt and Turkey have been backing opposing sides in the Libyan conflict. But now Erdogan says he spoke to al-Sisi about Libya. They said they would work together to try and end the war. So it seems the rivals are burying the hatchet. And it would help both sides. Take trade, for example. Egypt is already Turkey's largest African trading partner. This, their bilateral trade is worth $10 billion, and this is despite the rivalry. Yesterday, the leaders vowed to increase this to $15 billion. Erdogan also wants to increase Turkish investment in Egypt. It will help both economies. Then comes defense. Earlier this month, Turkey's foreign minister spoke about a deal, a drone deal. He said normalization was required to push the deal through. Turkish drones have gained a formidable reputation. 30, 30 countries have bought the Bayraktar T TB2 drone from Turkey, and Egypt may be joining that list soon. So Cairo gets drones, and Ankara gets a new customer. It's a win-win situation. The third benefit of normalization is political heft. Both Egypt and Turkey are major players in West Asia. 
They have stakes across the Arab world and Africa. By mending ties, they can present a united front on the global stage, which is crucial to build pressure on Israel. Both Turkey and Egypt have a lot at stake with the Gaza war. For the Egyptian president, al-Sisi, he wants to avoid a destabilizing influx of refugees. For the Turkish leader, Erdogan, he wants to maintain his reputation as a champion of Islam. Together, they can champion both causes. As I said, there are a lot of benefits to burying the hatchet, and it looks like Egypt and Turkey are now ready to reap the rewards. Okay, brothers and sisters, let's go to the next one. Now, um, remember I told you that the uh, there was always tension between Russia and um, Turkey. This is a uh, called Security. I think that's the name of the magazine, but it says the shifting balance of power in the Black Sea. So it says, in contrast to the deadlocked land war, Ukraine's tactics in the Black Sea have dealt Russia humiliating defeats with Turkey emerging as the sea's maritime power. Brothers and sisters, Turkey in the Black Sea now is the maritime power. I'm just sharing with you these things because the Bible says that Turkey or the king of the north, whoever was north of Palestine at the time of the end, which was Turkey, at a future time, it's going to come after hearing some disturbing news or whatever that is. We're not sure of every point of prophecy, but it would take over Israel. It would plant its tabernacles um, in, in, in that region. And then it says it will eventually come to its end. And we can see the concepts of um, how Christian nations, other nations tend to side with Israel more so, even though uh, Israel is killing many more uh, Islamics than, than, than killed Israelis. Uh, and, and even if, though America is saying, hey, hey, you're, you're going a little too far, there, there's no muscle behind those things that they say. And so I'm just sharing with you some things that people are ignoring. Here is a Newsweek article, Time to Rethink Turkey, the Sick Man of NATO. And I don't remember all the details, but that's a phrase that was used in history regarding Turkey, called it the sick man. I forgot the historical significance of that phrase. But this is what the article says. NATO, and by the way, Turkey is part of NATO, okay? NATO is arguably the most profound and consequential alliance in modern times. An attack on one is an attack on all, states Article 5 of NATO, all right? F NATO's founding document. But beyond the pact of collective defense, the NATO charter represents something deeper, a shared worldwide strategy and vision for peace. But a closer examination of Turkey NATO's increasingly unreliable ally suggests something very different. I'm reading on. It says most civilized observers were left in shock by the carnage, unreservedly condemned the barbarism and voiced support for Israel's right to uproot Hamas terror, the, the Hamas terror mafia. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan, however, criticized the Jewish state and justified the brutality of the Hamas assailants. Now, this is somebody writing the article. I'm not saying that he's properly quoting the Turkish, but there is obviously he said some things it would suggest that Turkey did in support of Hamas that they need to be concerned about in NATO. Erdogan's refusal to condemn the perpetrators of, of the single bloodiest day in Jewish history since the Holocaust continues a long and ignoble history of his providing aid, comfort, and refuge to Hamas. Not only is Hamas dedicated to the destruction of Israel, but also to the disruption of any currents toward peace in the Middle East. So, brothers and sisters, I just shared a few things with you that are very little known, very little is talked about. Everybody's focusing on the papacy. Even though the servant of the Lord says she's had her day, it's going to be 
the image of the beast. So let's take a little time to talk about that. The Bible says of this beast, Revelation 13, 11, and I beheld another beast coming out of the earth and he had two horns like a lamb and he spake as a dragon. That's the United States. We've studied this. So if you have missed sermons along this line, go to torso.church. Several, you know, the last four, three or four weeks, just listen to all those sermons at torso.church. Okay. The beast is a nation, according to Daniel 7, uh, coming out of the earth would be the opposite of the sea. According to Revelation 17, 15, the sea is peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. So a earth rising beast would be a beast that came out of a discovered land. That's the United States. It had two horns. And Habakkuk chapter three says the horns are the hiding of his power. It can be hidden power. And the hidden power of the United States was its granting of the religious freedom and civil freedoms to the people. Okay. That's what the Bible teaches, but it said it would speak like a dragon. That means the United States would repudiate all of these freedoms. And we saw that with a health crisis. We're not going to mention it, but we had a health crisis and freedoms were taken away. We have um, freedom of speech and other freedoms taken away, freedoms to believe that a marriage is between a man and a woman. That freedom is uh, challenged today under the auspices that they have to protect the freedom of the man who wants to sleep with the man. Nobody's saying that the man is going to get arrested for sleeping with the man, but we're, we're required to accept it as an institution of marriage. You see, so the real uh, challenge to freedom is the forcing of people to accept people's adverse sexual lifestyles. The same with abortion. A woman has freedom. She doesn't have to, and a man has freedom. They don't, the two don't have to sleep together and make a baby out of wedlock. That's where most of the abortions come from. Okay. And uh, that's where their freedom lies. But they would say, we don't have freedom to say that that's murder. So let's read on. The Bible says, he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him and causeth them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So United States would cause the world to worship the first beast. That's the Roman Catholic Church. We don't have time to go through there, but you go through past sermons at torso.church and you will see. Notice that to cause is to force. Okay. Uh, and we're going to show you that in a moment. And he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. This is the great deception that you're seeing in politics, brothers and sisters, in our religious churches uh, where people can see an insurrection. They can see uh, a riot. They can see something that it, people just flooding across the border against federal law. And they just make up an excuse as to why it's all right. And so, brothers and sisters, that's because of the great deception that is practiced. And our minds have been, sometimes it's music that is used. Sometimes it's dancing that is used in the churches. But it's, it's, it's a compromise starting with the leadership so that the people are dumbed down. And that's what you have in Adventism today and in the Sunday churches today. So notice what it says. And America would lead out in bringing homage to the Pope and deceiveth them that have that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image, that's a copy, a picture, to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. So America, brothers and sisters, would set up an image, a copy of the papacy, a copy of the work of the papacy. What would this be? We'll show you in a minute. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. This is representing a law that had deadly consequences if violated. OK, that's what this is talking about. So the image of the beast is a lawmaking process as well. And he causeth all both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, okay? So the mark is in the right hand or the forehead. The right hand deals with work in which we make a living. Some will not be deceived, but will surrender to the evil in order to make a living. The forehead deals with those who actually were deceived and really think that this is the moving of God. 
and they will not be able to buy or sell, it says, and no man might buy or sell, save he that hath the mark or the name or the number of his name. Those who have the mark, that's Roman Catholicism, they own Sunday, they claim it as their creation. The name of the beast, a name represents the character of a beast. That means you're, you're like that beast. So that's apostate Protestant. Why is it apostate Protestant? Because Protestants claim that their theory or their theme is the Bible and motto is the Bible, the Bible only is our rule of faith and practice. So why would they join hands with a national and then worldwide Sunday law when it's not in the Bible and the day of worship in the Ten Commandments was Saturday? And then... It says, who received the number, that would be everybody else. That's Muslims, sheiks, uh, Hindus, whatever, atheists that are going to give in so that they can buy and sell. That's where the pressure is going to come in, friends. It's going to be pressure. Anything that comes from force is of the devil. God does not force us. Now, we will have consequences if we choose not to serve him, but that's not force. He lets us not serve him, and he pleads with us not to do it that way because there will be consequences that we will face. Sin has its own consequences often, friends. That's why God tells us to not steal because when you steal, somebody's going to steal something more valuable than you like. Just a couple of these. Sunday is our mark of authority, talking about the United States, the second beast, causing the world to worship the first beast and receive this mark. Sunday is our mark of authority. The Roman Catholic Church says the church is above the Bible. We don't agree with that. And this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. That's the Catholic, Catholic record of London, Ontario, September 1, 1923. Now you're saying, well, what does this have to do with Islamic and, and, and Israeli war? And we're going to get to it. But just keep in mind, brothers and sisters, that there's some events that have to take place, and I'm going to show you they have to take place before the final close of probation. But during the struggle right before probation closes, the Sunday law is passed. That's why this is important. Of course, the Catholic Church claims the change Saturday, Saturday to Sunday was her act, and the act is a mark of her ecclesiastical authority in religious things. So let's get back to the Islamic Turkey, uh, I'm sorry, the Islamic Israeli war, the last one. You see, brothers and sisters, it's going to be very, very bad for God's people who keep the Sabbath. We're going to be maligned. We're going to be considered worse than terrorists. And there will be times where we're going to say, Lord, how long? And there are going to be martyrs. People will die because of this. We'll be brought into prison. Our property confiscated. It's going to be like we have never seen before. And God is going to use the Israeli Islamic movement as a sign. I'm going to show you why that we're near the close of time. This is what my wife read. And at that time, what time? When they plant the tabernacles in the glorious land. And then they are destroyed because nobody helps them. That will be a sign as we see their destruction. We will know it's almost over. Those of you can see, I have a climate Sunday that comes from democratic um, literature where they're pushing Sunday due to climate change issues. And then I have a former president in the lower picture standing with the Bible, advertising the Sunday service behind him. Okay. And um, so why did I bring this out? Because it doesn't matter who's in the office, whether they're Democrat or Republican. The Roman Catholic Church understands the Sunday law is going to be passed in their favor, whether it's a Democrat in office and they just focus on a climate pathway to Sunday worship or a Christian nationalist, white Christian nationalist movement. That is what many Republicans are pushing for. The Bible says when we see things happening over against the, in the fights, that last battle between Israel and Islam with Islam's agent, Turkey being Turkey at that time, shall Michael stand up the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at the time, thy people shall be delivered. Everyone that shall be found written in the book. Friends, if we ignore the things that God has said, even in the Middle East, we're not going to have the assurance that we need to have. 
And if we make the king of the north a papacy, it does not line up with what's happening. He, she's had her day. She's not going to play a major role. She's just going to reap the rewards in the background. That's what the Bible says is going to happen. I pray that you've been blessed by this study. We want to mention that although we're not going to get into it, there is what appears to be a digital ID coming in some form. And that digital ID is going to be used to separate those who can buy and sell from those who can. As you think about these things, brothers and sisters, I want to ask you a question. Are you ready for Jesus to come?
Father in heaven, thank you very much for this day. Thank you for the fact that at the beginning, you can tell us what's going to happen in the end. Father, we see a lot of things happening, and yet people don't realize these are whisperings. No, they're really shoutings of what's to come. The world taking the side of Israel in this conflict, though they have caused much more death than Hamas. But it's a fulfillment of prophecy for there will come a point in time where Israel and its agent Turkey will fight its final battle, overcome Israel, but then be destroyed. But Lord, why are you telling us this? Because we will go through an experience that we're told we cannot imagine. It will be so bad. And you will give us an indicator that it's almost over. For at this time, shall Michael and his angels, sorry, Michael stand up, the prince that standeth for his people. For those who don't know, that's representing Jesus being over and finished with his mediatorial work. Every case will be decided. Every, um, those who will be saved will be registered as such, and those who will not will be found wanted. Symbolically, he'll have some on the right and some on the left. Lord, we want to be ready when you come, and we thank you. We ask that you would bless us now as we continue to fight the good fight of faith, to believe, and to be careful, even in our interpretation of Bible prophecy, so that we don't miss things that you have said. For there's a lot of things, Lord, that we focus on that really aren't the main issues, and we ignore things that would be there to give us hope in that critical hour. We thank you in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You'd better mind, 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 you'd better mind. You better mind. You better mind. You better mind. You better mind. 